Good morning, everybody. Happy Heart Month. It is February 18th. It is around 11 a.m. Eastern time. If you're joining us live, there will be Q&A at the conclusion of this segment of Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. I am Lisa Salberg, founder and CEO of the HCMA. And before we begin today, I would just like to make a couple of announcements and a few thank yous. As always, thanks to our sponsors, Cytokinetics, Bristol Myers Squibb, Invite, and Boston Scientific. Through their funding and the support of our donors, programs like Tales from the Heart and other programs become available to you. So thank you so much for their sponsorship and their support of our mission. Additionally, I want to remind everybody that February 23rd is our first official HCM Awareness Day. We have a full day of programming scheduled for you starting at about 11 a.m. Eastern Time and going through till 7.30 p.m. So it's an all-day affair. You can join us at any time during the day by registering for the webinar at 4hcm.org. So we encourage you to sign up, join us throughout the day for the events, and we have a lot of fun stuff planned, a lot of stories we're going to share, a lot of research that's going on. So think of it as HCMA and State of the Union dress, and it lasts a long time. Um, and no division. Everybody's on the same team here, so that's a good thing. Today, I am joined by board member and committee chair, Vilora Daus, who is going to talk to us today a little bit about the legislative committee of the HCMA, Legislative Advocacy Committee of the HCMA, and some of the efforts that we're going through there, and tell us a little bit about herself and, and why she is giving up her time and her energy and her talents to the the big hearted cause. Good morning, Biller, and welcome. Good morning, Lisa. And thank you very much for setting all these podcasts and also introducing me today. So as you said, my name for the folks who don't know me is Biller Daus. Yes, I am a board member and I'm also the chairperson for our Elizabeth T. McNamee um, Legislative Advocacy Committee, but my journey with all of HCM related issues really started four years ago and I am a patient myself, a Holcomb patient. I joined HCMA actually three and a half years ago. Um, you know, why the time in between joining HCMA and being a patient? I was just like everyone else, even though I worked in the healthcare industry when it came after being diagnosed, I was a confused scared patient myself and even though i was reading as much as i can and to understand about the treatment my diagnosis where this is going to take me i was really clueless and my journey with hcma started after i talked to my um, genetic counselor and i said i'm reading everything i can get my hands on you know from reputable sites like mayo clinic and um, Cleveland Clinic, all the academic journals and publications. And I'm still confused and I'm still scared and I don't know what to say to my family members. And she just looked at me with those big eyes and she said, oh, you need to contact HCMA. You're not the only one. Trust me, there is so much information and so much knowledge. Hopefully they'll get you all on the right track and after understanding, you know, what is going on with your disease, as you said, like a layperson should. And frankly, as I said, I have been in the um, healthcare industry and I'm going to give my professional background a little bit and how it is connected to HCMA's work and what we're doing. But regardless where you are from and what background you have, unless you are a specialized doctor, because I did also go through those experiences with cardiologists who were like, you have what? So, <laughs> you know, the most important thing is when I joined here, I understood the special work, first of all, you're doing and all the staff is contributing to. But that's when, if you recall, I voiced it how I want to get involved and I how I want to contribute. It is a precious work that is going on here. And uh, with all the knowledge we have gained, we have made our families even comfortable sharing the information that they can understand. So anyway, 
Just like I said, after learning more about HCMA and its mission, I really wanted to take part in it. First, I volunteered. Then I became a board member. Now, the, we're, now I'm really excited because we are going to take on and embark on the most interesting initiative, which is the legislative advocacy to help children. And we're going to get into that more. Um, I also mentioned patient. Um, just recently, I had an open heart surgery for mitral valve replacement and septal myectomy. Honestly, Lisa, I'm going to say thank you very much. You set my mind at ease, my family's mind at ease by sharing the information of what is going to happen, what to expect, how I should communicate with the doctors, and what my recovery journey was going to look like. So I'm grateful to you for, again, how you opened my eyes and contributed to my education as a patient. Well, I'm glad that we're able to be here to do that. It takes a village, it takes the board, it takes the committees, it takes the staff, it takes the volunteers, it takes all of us. And all of us. That's, that's how we got here. So Billy, why don't you tell us a little bit about your professional experience prior to coming to understand that you had HCM? Sure. And this, again, hopefully will help everyone who's listening to us. As I said, when you're in the healthcare industry, unless you're a super specialized doctor, you're clueless. Um, my background, professional background, I retired after the diagnosis from Merck, one of the, as you know, top pharmaceutical companies. I was there for 15 and a half years. I held multiple responsibilities and positions there. Um, my last position, if anybody's interested in titles, was director of global market access and, you know, for launching products globally. Anyway, um, at Merck, I held different positions in access, pricing, and as I said, launching products, which for, you know, all medicines at the end and vaccines. But the most critical thing is I was responsible for U.S. and ex-U.S. markets where um, dealing, you know, mainly dealing with um, payers, governments, agencies, insurance companies, all the entities that ultimately decide what medicines patients can take, how much it's going to cost, and what kind of restrictions are going to be put in there. Okay. Um, so with that knowledge, um, I think I can contribute a lot to HCMA with its mission and with, with the vision and the legislative things that we want to engage in and do. Prior to Merck, again, building up on that um, information in the healthcare industry, I was with IMS, which is now IQVIA. It's the biggest healthcare data company. And prior to IMS, I was with University of uh, Pennsylvania Health System. My joyful start in the healthcare industry um, I was working with them in the quality division on patient care, treatment algorithms, outcomes, all based on evidence-based um, real-world data, and at the same time, obtaining patient voice through the surveys we were conducting, what was going on with the communication, the information they were being provided, etc. So it started me off with a wealth of information, and I loved it. So. That's my professional life. We can go on to the Legislative Advocacy Committee now. So I'm sure anybody listening would understand why you come here first as, as a patient, as, as a client of the yeah. HCMA. We have a conversation and I say, tell me a little bit about your background. And I ask everybody about their background, not for vetting purposes typically, but just to understand, what do you know about healthcare access? What, where am I starting from? Are you an artist and you think artistically? Are you an analyst? Do you think analytically? Are you a data geek? Is that where we have to live? And that's kind of where I start our conversation from. And I'm like, oh, you understand that part of healthcare, but this is different. This is your own heart. And then we start from there and, and we, we kind of meld the two together. So when you said you were interested with that background, you know that I wasn't going to be waiting too long to say, hey, come on board. And we've got that all set up now. So you were on the board for a while and we decided as an organization that we are going to be moving more towards a committee structure because we have so much work to be done in different segments of our of our 
breadth of work. One of them is the area of legislative advocacy. And just as a, a, a call out to the namesake, um, Elizabeth T. McNamee was a young woman who passed away from undiagnosed HCM back in 1999, 1998. And her family has been a, a contributor to the organization since that day and has donated well over a half a million dollars in that time to help us meet our mission. So as we formed this committee, I thought no better person to name it after than a young lady who was um, a law school graduate. Um, she was clerking for a federal judge at the time of her, her passing, and her name belongs on the legislative side of things here. We're going to change the rules because she lived. So Elizabeth lives on through our work, and I know her family's happy about that. So we organized as a committee. We've spent two years doing data analysis and review and strategy. And can you tell us a little bit more about what the committee's focuses are? We're not going to talk about what it isn't, but let's talk about what it is. Yeah. So if I may, before we jump into that, I want to also call out and um, you know give a shout out to the other members in the organization. We're not a big, big organization, but, but in our committee, other than yourself and myself, um, we have Aaron, who's our MD. We have Isaac, who is a PhD with wealth of information in clinical research, et cetera. And then we have Lindsay Davis, and who has worked on legislative issues in Ohio, um, especially related to HCMA, I mean HCM, and then Julie. Julie is our volunteer coordinator at HCMA. She is super special out of all of our support we get and the work she does with the volunteers, and it's going to get even busier and how she keeps us, you know, organized. So I do want to first give my heartfelt thanks to Julie to helping us do this month after month, week after week with all her kind support. So now let me bring it back to the goal of the legislative advocacy. Um, so we're working on, and the goal is actually to advance, as you said earlier, specific legislation and support the policies that is consistent with the HCMA as an organization, its values and its mission, okay? So there are so many issues we can tackle on, but we worked on all together to say, what kind of policies are we going to go after? Um, I'm going to list them and if, sorry, if it seems like I'm reading, but I do want to catch on to the you know key points I don't want to miss out on. Um, we're working on policies that are going to help improve health, heart disease surveillance, and I will come back to it. Um, protect against sudden cardiac arrest. There are multiple issues related to that. Again, in the q and I'm happy to go in depth and as well as you. Ensure access to high quality and affordable care, health care. Okay, protecting patients from harm. And this has with the this is related to with the ongoing novel and genetic treatments to come, etc., and how to provide education and improve quality of life. We can get to that also. Um, critically important address inequity in access to um, you know participation in and utilization of clinical research in the healthcare system to make sure that we have good representation of patient populations, especially with the ongoing new research, et cetera. Making sure when I say funding medical research, I don't want people to get idea, but it is guiding how the federal funding of medical research should be, um, you know, advanced to chronic heart conditions. That's one of, one of the um, topics we're working on definitely supporting family and caregivers, and improving health and biomedical education. As I said, as a patient, I even discovered 
not all cardiologists even are on top of the conditions that we go through, the nuances of our disease, et cetera. So increase that patient um, provider and caregiver, as well as public understanding of HCM. What is it, what we can do? And finally, um, advancing other HCMA mission, as I said, and values in addition to these priorities I mentioned. Um, and I'm sure there will be specific acts and events that will come up. But right now, what we're clearly working on is the um, most important healthy cardiac monitoring act. And we'll get into that more. So I'm going to pause you for a second. That was, it's a big list under yeah. the under the umbrella of the Legislative Advocacy Committee. And I, I want to just touch on a couple of items in this space that are critically important to us. And not everybody may think of these as legislative advocacy. They may just think of them as general patient advocacy. But at the underpinning of nearly everything we do in healthcare in the United States, there's some legislative language guiding so whether it is access to a health care policy, each state has different rules. There's federal rules. There's state rules. There's room to change some of these rules. And we need to be at the table having the conversations with those who are changing access to care. We need to make sure that the legislative language allows us access to the type of care that we need and that there are mechanisms to get out of an HMO or there's mechanisms to be referred to a high volume center when your local does not know what they're talking about or they're not comfortable with HCM. So that's one aspect. We worked on another project earlier this year that we talked about here in the podcast and that was the ISA review of the economic modeling of Mavicampton. Mavicampton, first in class drug, myosin inhibitor, coming under FDA review right now. We hope to hear in the coming weeks as to whether the FDA is approving it or not and under what conditions. So those conditions are things that we've been talking about for a year. We want high volume centers to be prescribing this. We believe that it's dangerous for community doctors to be prescribing a brand new drug for a disease they don't really know very well. And these are some of the things that the legislative committee has been working on and you were very uh, vocal participant in the ICER process. Um, and we have to go in there and we have to fight for good pricing. It's yeah. regulatory as opposed to legislative, but it's under the umbrella of our legislative committee. Obviously, we believe very strongly in AED, CPR, Good Samaritan coverage. Those are the easy things. Of course, we're, of course, we're going to advocate for that. But how do we do the hard thing? How do we find the undiagnosed? Let's do some quick numbers on this one. In the United States today, we know that under 150,000 individuals are currently under treatment for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We know by statistics that between one in 200 and one in 500 individuals have diagnosable hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, either by imaging or genetics. That means there are between 700,000 and 1.3 million people with HCM out there somewhere, just out there. Undiagnosed, yeah. Undiagnosed, maybe they're having symptoms and they're being told that it's just an innocent murmur. It's just athletically induced asthma. They're just a little anxious. We're hearing all of these things. They're the most common misdiagnoses associated with HCM. You just have a little mitral valve prolapse. Don't worry about it. Until you know that it's not HCM, it could be HCM. Let's rule it out. So how do we find, oh, a half million people or so? And that's really what we need to do. We're a tiny organization and thereby we can't knock on every door and ask people if they're having symptoms that are associated with HCM. So we're partnering with other organizations like the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology. We're, we're partnering with industry like Bristol Myers Squibb for HCM Awareness Day. And we are trying to raise awareness on what HCM is. And that's great. But how are we going to engage people at the doctor's office? 
How are we going to push those conversations to a very simple question? What is your family's heart health history? Not the myths. What do you know? What don't you know? And by putting that together, that's kind of where we started our mission with the, with the committee to say, this is the problem. What do you think we can do to solve it? So we brought in a bunch of interns in the summer of 2020, an interesting time. We collected a ton of data on state level regulatory language, on diseases, on frequency, on commonality and symptoms, and we put together a 300 and some odd page report, which you can go read at your leisure on our website. Um, but then we brought a smaller version down and now we have just tip sheets that we're going to be offering. But we did the deep dive. And why don't you walk us through a little bit about what the final product is? So, yeah. I'm glad you started off by explaining where we started and how we came to the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. One of the things, and for all the listeners, we are daily experiencing also, any subject you touch becomes political matter, right? So we said, let's start from children, um, reaching out and understanding the children's, um, you know, evaluations, etc. So we started with that concept because who's going to say no to any kind of child's well-being, you know, properly diagnosis and their safety, right? So we started with, okay, let's look at what is missing or is there anything that we can improve in the well child exams or the student athlete protection um, forms and evaluations that go on, right? Are there enough cardiac health evaluation um, questions? And, um, you know, let's, let's point back to Jersey for a minute. So yes. back in 2015, we did pass a law here in New Jersey. And we became the only state in the nation to ask questions about children's heart health. I will tell you that it was it was a passion project of mine. And I thought that as soon as we were done with New Jersey, we would just head off to the rest of the country and make it happen. But we needed to get more organized. We needed to have all of our data in, in order. And we needed to get, honestly, the thumbs up from American Heart Association. Because any office that you walk into is going to say, what does American Heart have to say about this? And we have vetted this through the American Heart Association, and they support our initiative. So that is a big step for people who don't understand what that juggernaut is. They're an amazing organization, but they're also an enormous organization. So we started with, hey, we did this in New Jersey. We'd like to do it elsewhere. Here's how it's working in Jersey. And that's where we came up with our language. So I just wanted to give a little bit more context there. So continue. So it's, it's awesome. And, and um, as, as I said, you know, let's look into the well child or student athlete, you know, evaluation forms, etc. As you know, and you might want to um, again list. I don't want to miss out on anybody, but critical organizations collectively worked on developing the original, um, you know, questions and evaluation, you know, um, elements that goes into those forms, right? Correct. But just recently, as we're working on this also American Pediatric Association came up with um, statements such as there's something missing in these existing forms such as going and evaluating further the cardiovascular health and the family history of the children so we can properly identify that and that's like exactly what's in our um, healthcare monitoring yet so you know when we put that together, we wanted to ensure the cardiovascular health needs of all the children, 19 and um, younger, um, also including that student athletes um, who are going to be going through um, the evaluation. But it is also to give the tools and the means to the healthcare providers to help identify the undiagnosed children and screening of these children, right? 
um, by understanding also their risk factors as well as their family history. So the act itself includes um, particular questions that we're proposing to be added to the well child and the um, student athlete um, evaluation forms. What we're also proposing to improve the proportion, um, professional development of the healthcare providers through an online training program um, that they can meet the needs of these children by understanding it better. Um, then also improve on the student um, athlete pre participation physicals, really, and educate the athletes themselves to understand the signs and symptoms that are linked with any condition that um, is- Cardi Different cardiac diseases. Exactly, and including sudden um, cardiac arrest. And then also, as I said, which is critically important to improve the ability of all the healthcare providers to identify children and families in time who are at risk for cardiac disorders, both genetically and congenital, um, congenitally. So we are starting on this um, state level. Um, Let me pause for advocacy. one second. Sure. Let me pause on that because while it's our committee and we drafted the legislation, we gave it a cute name, the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act, which acronyms out to HCM Act, but it's not just looking for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act will be looking for all forms of genetic and acquired heart disease in the young and giving families an opportunity to discuss their family heart history with their chosen healthcare provider in the confines of their own chosen healthcare provider's office. So we're not doing pop-up, come and check your heart for a day kind of situations, and they have their roles but we want people's healthcare housed or in an organized manner. We want them to know that they can speak freely about their family health history. Not everybody knows their family health history. Not everybody has contact with their biologic parent. Not every child is created in the old fashioned way. Some of them are egg and sperm donation. And what do we know about those, don or those, um, those donors? Um, we don't know everything. So this gives the family an opportunity to discuss these elements with their personal health care provider and say, hey, look, you know, I'm estranged from my father. You know, I, he died when he was 45, but I don't know what happened. And help them figure out, is it a cardiac issue? Is it a cancer issue? Do they need to be screened for something completely non-cardiac? But to have that conversation, the questions that we're bringing into the well child exam are the same exact questions that we've been looking at for years for sports and athletics. They're the American Heart Association pre-participation screening physical questions and elements. Look for a murmur, look for Marfan stigmata, look for hypertension, look at the family history, defibrillators, pacemakers, cardiac arrest, um, early uh, atrial fibrillation, transplants, we're looking at all of that and giving the family and the doctor the chance to make a referral for additional cardiac testing. Everybody doesn't need the same test. If you're having symptoms of an anomalous coronary artery and the echo and an EKG are not going to do you any good, you need a CT scan. So we don't want to mandate a test. We want to mandate a conversation and help educate those doctors on the referral process so that we make their lives a little bit easier and we answer the questions of families. Are we going to hit 100% of all potential diagnosed people here? No, we're not. I'm not gonna pretend that we're gonna hit every single person who's at risk and get them, but we're gonna get a hell of a lot more than we're doing by not asking anything. And it's kind of silly that we talk about other things in the well child exam and not one of the most important organs in the human body, the heart. You know, it's really it's important to wear your seatbelt. <laughs> it's really important. And they ask, are you wearing the seatbelt in the well child exam in most states? But you could be at risk for cardiac arrest, but we're not asking about heart history. 
So let's start doing it. It's easy. And it's not controversial. Nobody's saying this is a really bad idea. We should not do this. Why shouldn't you ask about your health at your doctor's appointment? All of it. So just wanted to give a little bit of clarity to what we are asking and what we're not asking here. Is, is this the end of the asks? Oh, honey, this is just the beginning. We, we have a lot more to do after this, but this is where we're choosing to start the conversation. Right. So what are we asking people to do? We're asking. I mean, it's, it's not that complicated ask to introduce the bill, right? The act, educate our policymakers because I'm going to come to it even though we think healthcare and it's only related to doctors. But as I said, the work that I did professionally <laughs> taught me otherwise, all the access, pricing, who gets what treatment, etc., are unfortunately or fortunately decided by people who are not directly healthcare providers. And they don't have the um, full answers, right, to everything properly. So this is where we come in. And this is where it's introduced the bill, help pass the bill at the state level. And then hopefully by increasing the awareness at each state level, then we can make it a federal um, you know, addressed issue that it becomes uniform within the country. But when we talk about you know, the act, passing a bill. I, I want to make sure that this is not being understood. Again, it's not a political issue. We're getting a health care, critical health care um, act. Yes, passed within our, you know, political environment in our uh, public policy environment. But there are particular things that we also need to engage in to do it properly which is educating them, informing them, et cetera. So I, I spent a bit of time on the local level in that political space, but I don't like the word political. Correct. Um, political is divisive. Governance is something else. Correct. And we elect individuals to provide governance. And look at the word governance. It's, it's setting a framework for how we're all going to behave in a, in a civilized society. That's what it's about. It's not political in the terms of us versus them. No, this is, you know, everybody has a heart. We are completely 100% sure of this fact. Um, we might question sometimes whether everybody does or doesn't have a heart, but <laughs> it's pretty much proven that everybody has a heart, whether you're uh, an independent, a Democrat, a Republican, a libertarian, a communist, you have a heart. Um, so we really don't care what lever you pull in a polling station, doesn't matter. No. And there are people with heart diseases in every aspect of life, every age, every ethnicity, every geographic location, every religion, every political persuasion, we all have hearts. And we should all be given the opportunity to know if there's something that we should do to care for our hearts differently. And that's the core of this. Exactly. So it's not political in the sense of we're going to argue about it. When we passed our law in the state of New Jersey, which for anybody who understands political gaming of systems and, and nonsense, it's Jersey people. Come on. It's New <laughs> Jersey. I'm just going to leave it there. We got the Well Child Act passed and implemented into law in under six months. That doesn't happen typically. This was a no brainer. People said, oh yeah, this makes sense. And we want to do this in more states. We've isolated 13 states that we were kind of focusing on to start with for a couple of reasons. Number one, they have a history of passing health-related legislation. Number two, we have some advocates or connections within the state that we think it will be easier to move forward with. And another little game, you know, we did with the numbers, 
the 13 states we chose represent 51% of the U.S. population. So if we can get these 13 done, we have over half of the country covered, and then we can go after the rest of the states. And also, once you hit a certain number of states, we're all on electronic medical records now. So when they reprogram the electronic medical records, it'll be a little thing that these are required in these states. Do you want to add on that module? And maybe the other states will add it on without legislation. But this is where we're thinking. But we can get to 51% with these 13 states. So we need a couple of legislators with big hearts, pun intended. And we need some advocates who are going to be, well, we're going to provide training. You're, we have a, an online system that you can just go right now. And it's in the comment section of the Facebook group. We'll put it in the podcast as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to help you understand what it means to, to do advocacy work, period. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then we're going to give you training if it's time to go provide testimony to a state house. You can just tell your story through our UJOIN app. You can even send a 30 second or 60 second video to your lawmaker and say, this is why I think it's important. Let them see your face. Let them hear your story. Let them understand why you're getting involved here. Um, we're, we're setting this up so it's really easy for y'all to participate in. Well said. I mean, the whole bottom line, um, you know, and our goal is one, like I said, create awareness and educate, like you said, policymakers, regulator, regulatory, um, you know, decision makers, etc., who have not so much information about HCM, and I'm going to use it, you know, I don't want it to be misunderstood, but who, who have limited knowledge. Um, you know, our job and our goal is to really educate and provide fact-based information to these policymakers, the elected officials, who are ultimately going to influence our healthcare, our treatments, our research. And in that sense, what we're saying is, if you're passionate and if this topic matters to you, especially starting off with our children's health, we need your voice, we need your energy. Join us, work with us, and it's not just, um, you know, technical um, involvement or anything, but it is a marvelous adventure, actually, to go through this whole um, advocacy work and make a difference simply in our laws. We're going to take questions in just a few minutes. If you okay. have any, you can post them in, into the chat now. Um, we have a couple of you watching us live um, as we're podcasting, so we can address your questions if you have any. Um, additionally, if you have any questions regarding this content after the live broadcast, please contact the office. Um, you can get us on our website at 4hcm.org, and we will align you with the right resources. So I want to talk a little bit about training. Um, we also have um, a wonderful partnership with Women Heart, and it's a great partner for us for two reasons. Um, number one, Women Heart has done some amazing work in legislative advocacy over the past 15, 20 years um, out of DC, um, really fighting for health equity for women and heart disease, but going beyond that as well. Um, so statistically speaking, and not to a definitive, women are more likely to bring their child to a well-child examination than a father, just statistically speaking, dads can do it too. Um, so we know that, but they have some great training tools and they have some great advocates that have done other work before, mostly on the federal level, not on the state level. And we're going to be doing a joint training session on March 22nd with our partners from Women Heart on how to best advocate and give you some tools and some ideas on how to get the attention of your local lawmakers. So um, that'll be available on the website shortly, and you can uh, sign up to join us for that training. Um, so additionally, our, our staff is here to help you. Uh, but we've kind of been a little bit busy for January and February getting HCM Awareness Day and February Heart Month ready to go. So come March, we will be all hands on deck for legislative initiatives, and our staff will be ready to respond to your requests, meet with your lawmakers, set up appointments, 
um, do virtual hill visits or state house visits with you. We'll get all of that stuff organized with you. We've got a lot of support here. Uh, we've got some great software. Uh, this, this company called Ujoin has a great system. You literally just go on the page. It's a formulated letter already. You can add to it. You can edit it. You can put a video and you can send it right to your lawmaker. It's pretty awesome. Pretty the awesome. letters are written, everything. I mean, we're, we're preparing all of those for our volunteers. Exactly as you said, it's just um, as simple as a few clicks here and there just to start the whole advocacy activities going. Yeah. It keeps it, keeps it rolling. So I'm going to wait for some questions to come in. And I just want to say, you know, this whole endeavor, when we started like, okay, we got to get organized here. What are we doing? How are we going to get this done? It seemed gargantuan to start at, <laughs> um, but it's, it's not, it's people. It's talking to people who also have families, who also have hearts, who also probably have some of their own issues going on that they're probably not going to talk about. And we're not asking to spend a lot of taxpayer money here. We're talking about an online training module. The one in the state of New Jersey was done for, I think it was under $30,000 to create the whole thing and train all the doctors for that amount of money. Um, I'm seeking corporate sponsorship to build out the, the next level of education and CME accreditation. So hopefully it will be completely budget neutral in each state, but we have to get there. We have to we have to work with our partners in other diseases to build that educational model and get the right information in the hands of practitioners. So let's pivot to practitioners for a while. They are asked so much. GPs, family practitioners, pediatricians, they are the gatekeepers for so many different issues. So we have to make it easy for them to understand what they're looking for and how to act. And that's part of the magic of what we've created here in New Jersey. The training tools are there. The referral pattern is clear. And I don't have great data yet because there's a piece missing from New Jersey on the data collection side, which we've added into the new language. But I can tell you this. People I know say, why do they ask me about HCM on my child's well child exam? And I say, you're welcome. And we put it there and now they're understanding it and they're, they're coming in contact with the words. They're also seeing things like ARBC and dilated cardiomyopathy and channelopathies. So we're becoming more comfortable with the words. That's step one. Step two, the doctors are being educated on what to do if somebody says, yeah, my cousin has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Well, does your dad have any issues? If that's out of your family or whatever. It's these questions that we're able to ask. And without those triggers, you're probably going to have so many other things on your mind during that well child exam. You're not going to think to ask. But if you check a box and say, yeah, I got a history of heart disease in my family. Well, what kind of heart disease? And we can do that dive together. And we can help that doctor find the right test for you and get the right people to the right tests at the right time to a high degree of certainty. Not perfect. Exactly, Lisa. I mean, the very well said because proper screening is the step one to actually eliminate the unnecessary use of resources, testing, or additional costs. It's like you said, simple questions that allow the healthcare provider to check a box or to say, okay, this person needs the appropriate follow up with a cardiologist not after an event happened when all the resources need to be pulled in place and god forbid when a young person lost their life but it is upfront at the very beginning to properly screen people so we can get the necessary information that is needed i mean it's um oh i want to take this to a real case we didn't discuss this part this is this is lisa ranting on podcast so <laughs> hang on it's this is the fun part. Um, if you go back in our awareness campaign for the month, there was a story shared about a young man named Derek. And Derek was lost to the fact that his mom passed early 
His, fa- his mother died before the age of 30. He was a young child. Nobody ever put two and two together that this child should be screened for heart disease. It just didn't happen because mom died. Life moved on. They thought it was mom's problem. Derek passed out um, in the summer of 2020, and he went to the emergency room. They said his mother died young of something with her heart. And they said, oh, it looks like maybe he had a seizure. Go see a neurologist. Nobody ever checked his heart. He was a black man in his late 20s, and he looked healthy. He did not get an echo or an EKG in the hospital that day. He went home. Six days later, not even, I think five days later, he collapsed after walking up a flight of stairs carrying his infant son in a, in a uh, car seat holder, a little baby carrier. He got to the top of the stairs and he collapsed. This time he didn't wake up. And the autopsy showed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They had him in the hospital within a week before. They knew there was a family history of heart disease. This man never had a chance to get the care that he needed. And had we, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, started asking questions in well child exams, is there a family history of heart disease? It would have been clearly documented in the record that mom died of heart failure before the age of 30. And they would have been monitored more closely potentially. So I can tell you many stories like this. There is an unfortunate connection here too. There's another story of a young man um, from New Jersey. Uh, His name is very familiar to me because I'm a child of the 70s. His name was George Jefferson. So I won't forget that one. Moving on up television show. Um, Again, a young black man in college, dies in his sleep in the dorm. I talk to mom and mom tells me about a history of her sister-in-laws dying in their 40s in their sleep. Nobody had ever asked, is there a family history of heart disease? She thought they were old at the time because she was only 20 and they were 40. Nobody ever asked what happened to them until it was autopsy time. We don't want to wait for autopsies. We want to give people the right care while they're here. Not pain, we don't want to give We want to give families answers, but I'd much rather give them a treatment path than an answer for why somebody has died suddenly and unexpectedly. And there are many families that have, that have hints of, of issues and HCM is a hereditary disease. So it runs in families. So we need to look for it. Um, So Ross is commenting that his family has AFib on both sides. Nobody really discussed it. Didn't find out that he actually had HCM until going to a center of excellence. And for his AFib. And they're like, oh, you don't just have AFib. You have AFib secondary to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So thanks for sharing that, Ross. So we all need to work together. And we have the we have the tools now. We have the actionable. And now the ask is you go onto the website, you click on I want to become a legislative advocacy volunteer, you get engaged, you go to our page on the website that says three clicks to save a life. You're clicking on the HCMA, you're clicking on you join and you're hitting send. Boom, boom, boom. Simple. You just put your address in and you send a letter to your state legislative offices and say, hey, we have something that we need to work on here. So um, that's where we're at. No other questions today. So I think we're going to wrap this edition of Tales from the Heart. Um, Any parting thoughts, Spiller? No, I want to thank you very much for actually setting this podcast up. So we can announce what we're doing. And as you said, we're seeking um, folks to join us. And um, I think Isaac had a wonderful word about it. The ambassadors for our, you know, heart health. And um, we want to have them as volunteers. Join us. Let's work together. Let's pass this bill. And let's start with a good path for our children you know, through their well visits and the student athlete evaluation time. So I thank not you, agree thank more. You. Thank you for all of your help, guidance, input through this entire process. I feel like we're like, in some ways it feels like we've kind of completed part of a project, but we're really just starting. So we're at a really good jumping off point. 
and we have all of our data in order. We have all of our partners in order. We've, we've got the ability to do this and bring it home and really help change the lives of families and help them not, not deal with mismanagement or missed opportunities. And we're going to improve on as we learn different things from each state yeah. as we're doing our work. So um, I, I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to it. And this is a great way to get back to life again after the major health problems I had <laughs> recently. And we're very happy that you're healthy again yes, and getting yes, back, me too. back into the swing of things. Um, I do have a couple well, of parting messages for everybody today. Just a reminder to check our website for our Big Hearted Warrior Tour, where patients can get education straight from the experts once a month on Zoom in the comfort of your own home. So go check our, our uh, events listing. Um, I want to also remind all those diagnosed with HCM that you're never far away from a group of big hearted friends in our discussion groups. Um, they have really taken off. We're as you know, we get 15 to 25 people per group now. Um, they're really well populated. They're a great opportunity to learn from your peers, um, learn more about HCM, not feel so alone out there. And I want to give a special thanks to Eric. I'm not going to use last names because I didn't ask him for permission. Um, we've created a frame for HCM Awareness Day, February 23rd. And uh, unfortunately, Facebook does not allow frames anymore to be created um, to go around your, your profile picture in an automated sense. So you have to drop it into our, our frame software kind of thing. And not everybody knows how to do it. So if you have HCM and you're in our private group, you can put your picture up and Eric will put it on the frame for you. Thank you, Eric, for doing that. Um, and then we hope that everybody will share them on their public page on the 23rd um, and people will start to see the faces of HCM are right in front of them all the time and they didn't even know it. So Biller, thank you so much for joining thank us on Tales you. from the Heart. And thank that's so much. a wrap. All right. Have you enjoyed this episode of Tales from the Heart? We hope so. Please visit us at 4hcm.org, become a member, become a donor, become a volunteer. Great news, everybody. HCM Academy is now available online. What is it? It includes online sessions, learning about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, patient stories about HCM and their management, and an opportunity to join online live with an HCM specialist to go over the slides, ask questions, and dig deeper into your understanding and knowledge of HCM. All CME courses are free, and you can find them at 4hcm.org or at the HCM Academy. Dot com. The Big Hearted Warrior Tour continues. For the latest dates, please check 4hcm.org. And thanks to our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, Cytokinetics, Invite, and Boston Scientific. Did you know discussion groups are available at 4hcm.org Monday through Friday? Almost every day you can find a discussion group, whether you're interested in learning more about ICDs, premyectomy, screening your family. There's a discussion group for you. Even if you just want to learn how to balance your mental health, we have that too. So please join us for one of our live discussion groups moderated by a peer volunteer and you can sign up in advance at 4hcm.org. Just check the calendar for events. Please contact the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association at 4hcm.org or by calling our office at 973-983-7429. You can contact the HCMA by email at support at 4hcm.org. Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the HCMA, is made possible through sponsorship from Boston Scientific, Cytokinetics, Tanaya, Invite, and Boston Scientific.